Perfect. Um, thank you to those who came and everyone for coming. Uh, we're very excited to have uh, Brent Hulke here uh, all the way from North Dakota, although Brent, you're in North Minnesota, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Um, as you can see, he's a research geneticist at the USDA, um, and he uh, works uh, on sunflowers specifically. Um, but uh, Brent, I'll let you uh, explain in more detail what you do. So please take it away. Sure. Um, yeah, so I, I am stationed in Fargo, North Dakota, um, which I'll go to my next slide here, uh, is in the far northern part of the United States. Uh, Canadian border is right here. So uh, I'm not in Canada, but I can see it from my back door practically. It's not too far away. Um, and uh, we're right on the state border of Minnesota and uh, North Dakota, where my lab is located. Uh, so uh, what I do is I'm a 100% research appointment with the US Department of Agriculture. I have academic privileges at two universities. One is at North Dakota State University, which is on the same campus that our research uh, building is located. But I'm also, uh, I have privileges at the University of Colorado Boulder. And University of Colorado, I think you can see where my uh, pointer is, hopefully, on the screen share, right? You can see my pointer, right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's right north of Denver there. So uh, there I'm, uh, I assist with uh, basically agroecology, sustainability questions, and that type of thing. So that's going to be something that will be a part of this presentation today, and you're going to hear about, uh, in addition to sunflower breeding and some of the other projects that we're working on. Just to get you a little bit of an idea of the geography we're dealing with here, um, you're going to hear a lot of mentions of North Dakota, which is the state here, South Dakota, which is uh, just south of it. Uh, you will hear about Kansas. You will hear about Colorado. You will hear about uh, one Canadian province as well, and that's Saskatchewan, and that's up here for those uh, that maybe don't know that. So uh, just kind of bear that in mind. We'll try to bring uh, back references to geography whenever possible. So just to give you a little uh, idea of what the, the task that is my charge today, uh, I was tasked with coming up with uh, subject matter on four topics. Uh, unfortunately, Ethan, I'm only going to be able to do three today. Uh, no I wanted to I'll touch on regulation, and then, and then I thought I had second thoughts about it. And the reason I have second thoughts about it is a lot of the things around regulation aren't really the subject of the research that I do and, and like the main topic. It seemed like off topic. The mm -hmm. other thing is... Uh, I am uh, <laughs> I am a member of the U.S. government. Like I'm, I, I'm employed by them, so I have certain rules, and I got to be a little bit cautious of causing international incidents. I don't want to do that. Um, if there is questions on regulation, specifically around uh, genetic modification or gene editing, I'm happy to discuss those with the group as we as we go along in it or at the end. But uh, I'm leaving that out of the presentation today. Um, but, you know, the first, the first question when Ethan and I were uh, talking back and forth about what this uh, discussion would be about is really, you know, trying to give everybody an idea of what plant breeding is and why people care about it. So I thought I'd start out by, by saying why I care about it. Um, I care about it because I grew up on a farm. I'm a farm kid. Uh, my Parents still raise uh, about four different types of crops, and they also have uh, Holstein dairy cattle that they milk. And that was a type of upbringing that I had. My dad also had a side business where he sold seed, hybrid corn seed and soybean seed. Uh -huh. And as a part of that, I was, um, I got to meet a lot of people in the seed industry very early in my life. I got to meet salespeople, marketing people and researchers. And the researchers really got me interested in it. So right out of secondary school, uh, before I went to college, I, I got a job for a summer as an assistant to a researcher. And that was in plant breeding and it kind of, uh, it kind of took and I've, I've stuck with it ever since. So that's why I care, but why should anybody else care? Well, I think the thing that a lot of people come up with right away, the knee jerk reaction, is we have an increasing population, which is kind of true, right? Uh, there's definitely parts of the world where we're seeing uh, higher increases in population than others. We're also seeing migration 
um, into Europe, as, as many of you know, uh, we see migration into North America. There's a lot of uh, population movement going on among humans. But the thing that really pervades this problem is the fact that population increases are happening pre predominantly in the ecologically, environmentally, and economically most sensitive parts of the world. And so plant breeding really needs to focus on trying to do whatever they can, whatever we can to stabilize plant varieties so food is available even in the most ecologically, environmentally, and econ economically sensitive parts of the world. And Brent, could you um, expand on that a bit? What, what areas are you talking about when you say- uh, well, I, I, would, I would think uh, Africa is, is a primary place. It's, it's been the focus for the last 50 years, ever since the Green Revolution, uh, is this idea that um, we need to make sure that not just the first world is sustainable in food production, but uh, really all aspects of humanity, all, all places in the world have the ability to produce their own food in a way that's, that's sustainable. So uh, even part of the work that I do, we're starting to do work with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as USAID, to try to ensure that there's farmers in East Africa, predominantly Uganda, uh, Rwanda, Kenya, that have access to sunflower hybrids that will uh, allow them to produce their own oil seeds. Mm -hmm. So, and that's really kind of a, a, a place where oil seed production is lacking. A lot of the focus has been on things like wheat. Um, that's the, the kind of the poster child of the green revolution. A lot of work has been done on that, but we need to expand the, the breadth of uh, crops that are available to the third world. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, it, it, the big thing right now is climate change as well. We're all aware of the fact that we need to make uh, crop production not just as optimal as possible, but we have to make it predictable and stable as well. That's a high order to ask. And, and what's even worse is now we're being asked to, carp, to be able to capture carbon using plants and somehow bury it. Um, and I don't think that, I think these are good ideas in theory, but the application has yet to be fully realized and, and optimized for sure. We're not even close to having that optimized. And we're gonna get back to that discussion uh, towards the end of the talk. But uh, I think one of the biggest drivers of plant breeding is the profit motive. If it wasn't for that, I don't think we would see nearly the amount of uh, corporate investment, uh, also um, uh, private foundation capital, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's a big driver of plant breeding. I don't think we would have that type of driving um, if it wasn't for the fact that, you know, although innovation and genetics is expensive, the returns are pretty lucrative. So there's there's a lot of value that can be can be made from the type of research that we're talking about, um, you know. So who benefits uh, specifically? You know, to to draw on uh, uh, Lenin's uh, favorite phrase, his favorite quote: um, "Agricultural producers do to some extent, right? Um, production has become easier. Agricultural production has become easier because of plant breeding." It's certainly more predictable, you know, as we respond to the needs of uh, that climate change are, are putting in the challenges that uh, climate change is putting in front of us. Increasing stability of plant varieties is, is inherently good for producers. Uh, does it actually increase their profit per hectare? Uh, actually, the evidence is it, it probably doesn't. It, it does make it more efficient, but as far as increasing the, the profits per, per unit area, uh, it's not doing that so much. Uh, but that's not to say that it doesn't benefit producers, right? Because they benefit what? The, the profit. So, so you're saying that um, even though the uh, strains and the and the cultivars are are better and more efficient, efficiency doesn't necessarily translate into profit for the farmers per acre. Per acre. Yeah, but if if a farmer is very good at using uh, the most up to date varieties and has an optimized production, you do get uh, economies of scale working in your favor. You can be a really, really profitable uh, producer uh, using the, the best and the, the greatest varieties that are available to them. Um, but as far as the profit per eight, per hectare, it is, uh, a, it's, that's a different calculation, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just it's just really uh, a, a realization that economies of scale are acting in agriculture is basically what I'm saying there. Okay. 
Uh, society and governments, uh, obviously, uh, there's always uh, political stability that comes with a well-fed society. Uh, that's very important. Um, so we have a, a social contract that we need to uphold to try to uh, keep everybody fed. No. And, and as far as, uh, you know, who else benefits, uh, all of the industry that's involved with the supply chain uh, does benefit. Uh, we get efficient resource acquisition at all points in the supply chain from farm gate all the way up to finished food product and predictable supply, which are, which are all good things. Mm -hmm. So what's my role? My role uh, in, in plant breeding and specifically in sunflower breeding is I'm the only public sector sunflower breeder in North America. And in my in the private sector, my friends in the private sector, there's really only a couple of them that are uh, present in North America. Uh, by and large, sunflower is a very Eurocentric crop. Uh, a lot of the research is going on in, in France, Spain, uh, Central Europe, Eastern Europe. Uh, I would say that there's probably more people working on uh, this crop in the Ukraine than there is uh, in the United States, uh, quite frankly. So uh, those are my peers. Uh, we do a lot of work with uh, uh, European researchers. Uh, uh, geography, we're looking. Uh, how are your Ukrainian peers, by the way? Uh, I wish I knew. Uh, right now, it's very hard to contact them. I know a couple made it out of the country. There was one that's in Latvia that I just heard from. Uh, but it's 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 very touching, though. I sad to hear about it. Are they able to still do what they were doing before, or is it now, uh, you know, different yeah. problems? Well, they're trying to carry on as best they can. Uh, the largest uh, research organization in the UK, Ukraine working on sunflower is actually uh, was based in Kharkiv. Oh. And if you know the Ukrainian geography, that's very close to the Russian border, and it was taken over. It was occupied by Russia for, I think it was about two months. Okay. So I don't know what's left of their their research grounds. Uh, mm -hmm. One thing that I'm keeping an eye on is is seeing if after the war is over, uh, if there's opportunities to help them rebuild their research infrastructure. Um, so I've already uh, been talking to the U.S. State Department about the possibility of doing some sort of exchange scientifically. So we'll see how that happens after the war is over. But for right now, it's 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 scary, quite frankly. Yeah. Imagine I can't even imagine really. <laughs> I can't <All> right. <laughs> either. I can't either. We should be happy where we're at. Um, so uh, that's that's my charge. I, I also operate de novo domestication uh, programs for uh, two up and coming crops that I hope will eventually take off. One is Lewis flax, which is a perennial flax relative, and another is a sunflower relative called uh, Silphium. Both of these are native to the United States and Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll talk about, uh, more about those later. Uh, just to kind of give you an overview of uh, what a plant breeding cycle is, what a day in the or a year in the life of 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 uh, me and and my staff is. Uh, this is kind of an overview of what a year looks like. It's uh, as you can see, the year is circular. Um, once we're done with one task, we lead to the other, and it eventually just uh, forms a cycle, a yearly cycle. And uh, out of the yearly cycle comes products. Into the yearly cycle comes uh, uh, different and new uh, genetics that we try to incorporate into our breeding program. So I'll try to I'll try to do an overview of what this year is. Uh, that's a lot to take in right there. That one slide. So we'll break it up a little bit for you. Uh, so in May we'll start there because spring is uh, is in May where I'm at, and uh, basically what we do is we we try to advance about 3,000 inbred lines that are part of our initial development phase. Um, but sunflower is a hybrid crop, so we also have to do evaluations. Evaluations aren't done on those inbred lines. They are done on hybrids, which are crosses between two inbred lines. Mm -hmm. So as a part of our process, we have to make those crosses, and those crosses are evaluated at uh, in three US states and one Canadian province. So South Dakota, North Dakota, Kansas, and Saskatchewan. Uh, and at each of those sites, we have uh, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 hybrids that are being evaluated. So it's actually a fair amount of, of work that's being done. 
And that's day by day, by the way, uh, done by yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we use mechanical equipment for the planting and everything, but we we try to uh, put together our seed packets. The seed packets get organized. They get taken out to a field site, and we dump them in the mechanical planter. And it's all done by uh, GPS. The, the 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 running of the tractor it does very nice straight lines, mm -hmm. even in not so nice fields, and uh, we're able to uh, get everything planted. So uh, come around July, August, the uh, fields that we planted look something like this. We see, you know, these field breaks in between um, roughly six meter long rows, and they're in a grid pattern throughout the, the field. Each uh, single row is a different genotype uh, in between those uh, those uh, bare soil uh, markers between. So uh, over a grid like this, we're, we're talking, you know, again, uh, at this one particular site we got in the picture, there's something on the order of 5,000 different genotypes there. Yeah. And within our field here, we have about two and a half hectares of nursery rows uh, in this uh, right before blooming in order to isolate the heads from pollinators and to, to ensure that they set self-seed. Setting self-seed allows us to develop inbred lines that are genetically pure. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to set out somewhere on the order of 15,000 head bags. And Ethan's probably thinking, man, did I just sign up to put out 15,000 head bags <laughs> this summer? The answer is no. Uh, we have a lot of people that help with this. So it actually isn't as intimidating as this. And we have an entire month to do it. Uh, we also make 3,000 hybrid crosses, which also are as bad as it seems. Mm -hmm. um, but it does involve moving a lot of pollen around. I will say that. And the crosses, by the way, sorry to interrupt. But the um the crosses, by the way, and all the genotypes that you have. How what is the genetic variation between them? Are we talking like a single nucleotide or uh, something larger? Oh no, oh no, no, no. They they're going to vary across the genome. So each one is its own unique beast. Mm -hmm. And in sunflower, we find that uh, there's quite a bit of genomic plasticity, is what we call it, which yeah. just means that the size of the genome also varies between plants. And this is driven by uh, a DNA mechanism called uh, transposition. Yeah. So about 82% of the sunflower genome on average is retro transposons. And they do a lot of, uh, maybe you call it damage to the genome. They move uh, bits of DNA around and, and that's what results in the wide variety of genome sizes we see between between lines within the same species, it's really quite incredible. They're very active in the sunflower genome then. Absolutely, yep, they sure are. So, uh, September and the plants start looking like uh, this picture off to the right, they're starting to get to maturity. Uh, that hybrid in front of the camera there, it actually became physiologically mature that day, uh, the browning of the bracts on the heads indicates that they've no longer taking in any more nutrients, they're starting to dry out. Uh, within about three weeks after this picture was taken, uh, a small combine, not unlike the one to the left here, which is our, our newest one, um, will go through the plots and, and take the, the harvest, it'll record yield, and it will allow us to get a sample for post-harvest analysis. The seed sample from post-harvest analysis then gets taken to the laboratory in the winter and it gets processed through uh, this machine here, which is uh, Oxford NMR, uh, uh, imported from the UK. It's a great piece of equipment. Um, we'll non-destructively sample the seed and tell us what the oil content of the seed is without even having to crush a single one of them. Uh, mm -hmm. on, on the other side of it, we also wanna know what oil quality is within these, these oil seeds. So we do oil composition analyses with a gas chromatograph. Oh, so that, that is a destructive assay. So we spend a lot of our winter doing these type of things. And what are you looking for in composition? Uh, the uh, Basically, we're looking at composition of the fatty acids. So how much saturated fat, how much polyunsaturated fat, how much monounsaturated fat, because that dictates a lot in the way of uh, what end market a sunflower seed would go to. And... Uh, within that marketing channel, what its end use would be to the human, for human composition, high oleic acid uh, sunflowers typically 
our most stringent uh, quality, uh, they have this most stringent quality threshold. Mm -hmm. And uh, they tend to uh, go into things like uh, fried foods, uh, uh, potato crisps, um, French fries, that type of thing. Yeah. So the so, acid variety, would that have like the highest profit motive to create a hybrid that creates the highest amount? Yeah. Yeah. And, and very high uh, oleic acid levels are possible in sunflower. We've gotten it as high as 94% of the oil. Wow. And at 94% of the oil, assuming that about 50% of the seed total mass is oil, you're talking, you know, when you're looking at a sunflower seed with the hull on it, with the outer shell on it, um, that seed could be as much as 50% oleic acid. Wow. And what is the in industry standard at the, at the moment? Is it near 50% or? It, well, it, it is for, for total oil content, we're above, uh, typically above 42% mm -hmm. and as high as 52. Okay. And for the oleic acid, it's the same? It's uh, about 85% is the threshold. That's the floor. If it goes, if it goes below 85%, it actually gets rejected. Oh, wow. That's the threshold. Yeah, they have very strict uh, thresholds on the quality aspect of it. Yes. You want me asking then as well, what happens to those rejects? Where do they end up? <laughs> they end up uh, usually as bird seed. The, oh, the oil funny. type sunflower seed uh, will end up in uh, being used for bird seed. And that also is a very high profit market. Uh, a lot of uh, sunflower seed gets sold as bird seed. A lot of people buy it, so uh, it's it's a it's a big market. A lot of people like consumers? walking birds. What's that? Just consumers, people feeding birds is the second biggest market for sunflower. Wow, I didn't know there were so many uh, bird enthusiasts out there. There, there certainly are in, in America. I, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not sure what the market share is in Europe. Uh, Europe grows more sunflower than North America does. Um, I think more of it goes to oil there just because of the the amount of production that's that's, that's undertaken. But uh, I, I imagine that it's also true somewhat in, in Europe as well, that there's a lot of bird enthusiasts feeding birds. So at the same time that we're doing these lab analyses, we're also running a winter nursery. And our winter nursery is in, in Chile. Uh, uh, where we're at in Chile is somewhere about uh, halfway through the country, just south of Santiago. So uh, Chile is a very narrow country, uh, mountains on one side and, and the ocean on the other. And there's probably about 80 kilometers between the two. See in the background of the picture here, those are the Andes. Uh, impressive mountains. It's not every day that you get to see the top of them in a picture, but here you go. Uh, this uh, two sets of inbred lines, uh, one that's single-headed on the left and multiple one on the right, are good examples of what we call female line in a hybrid and what we call the male line in the hybrid. All our male lines are branched. The reason why the, this is done is it extends the period of pollination and allows for bees or humans a longer period of time to make that cross. And the females actually have what's known as a male sterility gene which uh, renders it not to produce pollen, but only to produce stigmas. And that makes it really easy to do those 3000 crosses I was talking about earlier. And it takes quite a massive crew, even in winter nursery, where we only have about a thousand rows. So it's about one third of what we do uh, in North Dakota. But you can see here the, the crowd that we had uh, working our fields uh, this year. The one tall guy is, is the, the guy from my program. All the, the rest are uh, Chileans that uh, work in uh, actually quite a number of different companies' uh, production fields. Is that Brady, by the way? That's Brady, yeah. <laughs> they, they all decided they needed to take this picture as, as some sort of joke because everybody was laughing about the giant all week. They wouldn't believe him if they, if they tried to convince their friends they were with a giant. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. He's extremely tall. <laughs> so through this yearly cycle, what we hope to do is we hope to get uh, new inbred lines that form uh, new hybrids that are valuable. And I'll give you just one example of one where I can, that I consider a success. So here in this uh, picture in the lower center, you can see uh, hybrid at bloom. This particular hybrid is only 1.3 meters tall. Uh, it flowers extremely early, uh, about 55 days after planting. 
this is useful because um, a lot of times we have uh, limitations on when we can plant or on the other side of things when we can harvest. If you're a sunflower producer that's in an area where there's a lot of uh, blackbirds, you wanna uh, get your harvest out early. So you have an incentive to plant an early maturing hybrid. Also, we do this thing in central and, and the Southern United States, uh, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, where we'll grow a winter wheat crop and then right after the winter wheat is harvested, we do a sunflower crop right after it. And that's called double cropping. And they, they can do that because of the length of the growing season they have. Um, but you can see here, this, this hybrid, which is suited for those type of, of uses, uh, is making a, a very high yield, 2,500 uh, kilograms per hectare uh, compared to some of the tech varieties that we have. These are uh, currently available uh, hybrids on the market. We can see a huge improvement uh, in this one. And not all of the uh, breeding stuff that we do has this type of success story, but this particular hybrid does. So we're always happy to see, you know, uh, occasions where there's huge innovation. And not just in uh, the North, but we're also seeing this uh, same type of improvement and same type of uh, increase in yield in the South. These are... Um, a quick question is actually not related to this, but I was wondering about the inputs you use for the trials. Do you have a experiment with different inputs like organic production, inorganic production? So that makes it really hard to do um, reductive science. And I, I try not to be too reductionist, but uh, the one thing that we try to do with our hybrid trials is we try to match what the current practice is for the producers, even if we don't completely agree with it. Um, it just makes the, the work most relevant to the greatest number of people possible. Um, so I'll, I'll give you an example. In South Dakota, they like to plant very late. And while I don't approve of that, I think we should be planting early in that, that area. That's what they do. So mm -hmm. we will mirror what what their practices will plant our trials late and we'll actually plant them within their fields. We actually ask the uh, farmers if we could uh, grab, you know, two hectares of land and uh, reserve it for, for research. And we get a lot of help that way. But in terms of like pesticide input, I don't know, herbicide input, could you, for example, show that you can get the same yields with lower artificial inputs, for example? I don't know. Yeah, we could, but again, we we do follow what the what they do, uh, unless there's a specific reason, like we have a special funded project to look at sustainability under reduced uh, insecticides or, or herbicides. Then then we will we will do that. But typically, we do follow whatever the the farmers protocol is. I see. Okay, thank you. Sure. So uh, I'm not sure uh, because of. We're having a great conversation. This is this is awesome. I'm I'm really happy about this. Um, it, was, it was more than what I was expecting. So I got a lot of content, and I think we're just going to uh, go over these maybe a little bit quicker than I was planning. But uh, that's perfectly fine with me. One thing I want to talk about is the seed weevil, and this is the reason why I actually do want to plant um, earlier in South Dakota. And you're going to see why in a little bit. Uh, this is work that I do with. Uh, uh, another scientist at our research center, Jared Prasivka, and uh, we share a uh, research technician, Zach Terrible, uh, that's working on this project. So um, again, just to give you a little bit of uh, geography, uh, this is North Dakota, this is South Dakota. Those are the, the number one and number two states for sunflower production in, in the United States. Uh, they're both very similar in a lot of ways, However, for this major insect pest that eats the, the seeds, it actually grows into the outer hull of the seed and eats the kernel out without you being able to see it. It's a really, really nasty pest. Um, the numbers of this pest that we see are drastically different between these two states. We see in South Dakota about two to three, maybe four times as much damage as we do in North Dakota. And we're wondering, you know, why would this be? So uh, our entomologist, Jared, uh, spent some time just trying to uh, study it, study the literature, study what he knows about the pest and came up with this list of things. That is the reason why we see more of it in South Dakota. And uh, one is overuse of pesticides. They use uh, pesticides much, much more to the point of abuse in South Dakota. 
And it, it might be also kind of a self-fulfilling cycle um, where you see more insect pests coming in, you tend to want to react. So you do insecticide sprays. And by doing more insecticide sprays, you're building up resistance in the insect population. So it's a nasty cycle. Uh, there's other um, maybe more time background reasons why it's happening as well. South Dakota has warmer winters, as you would expect. Um, in fact, uh, due to climate change, we, uh, we've seen the six warmest winters in this region since uh, 2012 on, on historical record. And our historical records date back to, I think, roughly 1880. So the six warmest winters since 1880 have happened in the last decade. Uh, there's limited tillage in South Dakota. This is meant as a way to preserve soil moisture and to reduce erosion, but it also has the tendency to, to leave a perfect winter environment for these insects to overwinter in the soil. And we're seeing just a huge increase of uh, sunflowers. Uh, in central South Dakota, the numbers are way up. Um, late planting also factors into this as well. So the critical point to kill insects in the soil over winter is right around negative four to negative eight. And as you can see here, we're not reaching the, those type of soil temperatures in South Dakota. We do in North Dakota more often. That's why we're seeing, part of the reason why we're seeing less weevils there. Um, also, South Dakota has a, uh, a lot of the land area devoted to sunflower in South Dakota is in a very concentrated area. And um, you know, even in that concentrated area, there's just, lots and lots of fields. In the bottom left corner here, you can see all of these uh, little yellow squares. Those are the places where sunflower was grown two years ago in Sully County. So um, there's, there's probably as much sunflower being grown in this region of South Dakota as any other crop combined. It's about half sunflowers. So when you have a major sunflower pest that isn't being controlled, and then you have a large amount of acres year after year, you also, you know, when you have that type of land area devoted to it, you tend to uh, build up uh, populations over time. And that's exactly what's happening. The other thing that's interesting is they uh, plant very late. So right about here on the state scale, uh, we see uh, bloom happening for uh, sunflower in, in South Dakota, somewhere around the 5th of August to the 12th of August. The insect pest is emerging way, way back here, right around the 1st of July. And it's able to, the adult weevils are actually able to uh, lay eggs that are viable on sunflower plants right around the 17th of July. And these guys will continue to be viable uh, throughout the rest of the field season. Um, one thing that we're trying to push people towards is early planting, like I said. If we were able to plant, say, uh, so that bloom has happened around the 15th of July, well, there's almost no weevils that would be able to lay eggs. And if there's no eggs, then there's no infestation. It's an interesting, interesting thing that we've ran across in the literature. And how, what does this look like in practice? Well, we actually did try growing uh, basically the same sunflower hybrid at different times. Uh, if you planted the 27th of May, we were seeing about 27% damage. You can see the damage kernels here, the ones where there's uh, kind of a black on the, the x-ray. June 3rd, it was about 51%, that's this one. And at June 17th, which is a typical planting date, 96% of the kernels were damaged in this field. Now this is without any insecticide at all. So this would be an organic style setting. Uh, would be absolutely devastated if we just followed standard practice with planting. But early planting works much better. So can we do early planting? As it turns out, uh, we have a large window for it in South Dakota. Uh, anywhere in this blue area is actually legal planting uh, time for sunflower, according to our crop insurance agency, our national crop insurance agency. So a farmer anywhere in that area could plan to get full insurance coverage on their crop. Um, if we were to even plant kind of in the middle part of that range, we would see very, very low damage. This, this asterisk here uh, corresponds to about 10% damage. Very few farmers are growing uh, or planting sunflowers at that time. You can see by the low bars here on this bar plot, number of inferred units. 
What is more typical is our pipe from way out here, and that's the point where we see that 95 percent damage. So, Brent, what is um pressuring farmers to uh, plant their sunflowers so so much later in the season? You know, do they know about the benefits they could get just from planting a bit earlier? Because um, if I saw this and I was a farmer, presumably I'd be very uh, excited to push my my window a few months earlier. But I feel like I must be missing something. Well, the, the, there's two pieces I think that are missing. One is education and the willingness of a very large group of people, you know, we're talking hundreds of people, to get the message in an efficient way. So it's really extension of education out to the producers is, is a limiting factor. The other thing is um, even if we can get that information out to them, there are competing factors. There's other crops that need to be planted. Uh, a lot of these uh, producers are also raising cattle. This is an area where cattle ranching is a big business. Um, imagine, you know, the Western movies where you see them moving, you know, a bunch of cattle on horseback. That type of stuff is still happening out there. Not everybody's on horseback. Some are riding ATVs and, and pickup trucks, but it's it's still very big business. So there's all this competing stuff that's happening. I know a lot of pr uh, producers that are saying, well, I wish I could be planting today, but I have to do cattle work today. I have to mm -hmm. work the cattle day. So uh, there's a lot of competition for time and huge expansive uh, amounts of land that these, these guys run. Uh, you know, 10,000 hectares isn't a small number. I mean, that's pretty typical. So a massive amounts of land that these, these folks run. So that's the, the large thing that's happening. So, you know, from my perspective as a plant breeder, this is an interesting problem. So what can we do to counter this? Well, uh, one thing that I've already talked about is emphasizing early maturity in addition to early planting. So that's one thing that we're pushing. We're doing a lot of work uh, on genetics in that area. But the other thing that we have in our tool belt is we actually have a very good source of resistance. And it seems to be uh, one or two genes. We're, we're still figuring out the genetics of it, but the, the, the resistance is very robust and it's definitely heritable. So the question that I've got as a plant breeder is, is how do we extend this to the, the producers so that they use it wisely? We need to make sure that it's a sustainable resource, that it doesn't get overrun because the, the insect evolves to counter the resistance. So we already have a way of doing that that's well known throughout the world. Uh, refugia systems work, they, they prevent the uh, onset of uh, resistance in the insect populations for the most part, they do a really good job of that. But the, the question that I have- what a, what a refuge system is. So, so the idea is that you plant uh, something very similar to the resistant hybrid that's susceptible within the same field. And ideally you mix the seed in with the resistant seed so that the insect doesn't always just encounter um, plants with the resistance, that there actually are some plants that we allow the insects to reproduce on. And by doing that, we change the gene flow and mutation rate in the in the insect. So we prevent the evolution of resistance to the resistance as it were. Yeah. So that's the idea behind it. It's a, it's a really neat idea and it actually works pretty well in practice in, in a number of different applications. So we do need to do this with, with this particular insect resistance that we have that's new. Um, but we're, uh, we also need to counter this issue with having huge bus pressure in South Dakota. So will the resistance work under such high pressure? This is actually something we don't know. Can you get to the point where you have so many insect pests in a field that the resistance just doesn't matter? And that's that's actually an act, active area of investigation. But the, the conclusion really is in order to counter a pest like this, you need to consider holistic management. You need to consider early planting date you might need to consider tillage, even in places where tillage isn't typically practiced. And you definitely need to look at all the different things available in the plant breeders tool belt, early maturity and resistance. So let's see, what are we doing for time? We're really kind of running towards the end of time here. So yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to go forward to the end here. Um, I want to talk about the future just a little bit. All right. So we have, you know, a number of concerns that humanity's got to face because of climate change. And uh, it's, 
really unclear to me and to a lot of people if climate change is going to be the big disruptor of, of humanity or if humans will continue to excel at, at innovation as we have for you know greater than 10,000 years. But plant breeding is really kind of at the center of this debate because availability of food is going to be important in the future and of course the stability of food production. Um, and the, the big question that a, a lot of sustainability advocates ask is, is it possible to engineer our way out of this problem or is it more serious than that? And often what's brought up when we talk about this uh, in sustainability circles is uh, this idea of Javon's paradox, which is as we have increases in efficiency, you know, let's say we have more efficient cars on the road, so we're using less petrol, uh, less fuel, you know, less fossil fuels being used, we actually see people <laughs> do more traveling and that just increases consumption. So, you know, this is a problem with the idea that we can engineer our way out of things. However, there is, um, you know, something else that's being picked up on. And I think all of you probably saw the uh, latest IPCC report that came out this week, where uh, once again, they've made an urgent call for climate action. And what are they calling for? They're calling for two things. First of all, reduction in uh, greenhouse gas emissions, which we've heard many, many times before, but they're also asking for us to find ways to adapt to human caused climate change. So what does this mean in kind of a theoretical framework? Well, when I hear stuff like this, I think of this concept by Halling of the adaptive cycle. And I don't know if any of you have seen this before, but it's something to, to think about in the context of climate change. If we can't completely reverse everything that we've caused in terms of damage up till now, the ability to adapt is gonna be very important. So uh, we all know that there's exploitation of resources that has occurred by humanity. And eventually we start to see, oh, we're, we're going into a, a period of error. So we need to uh, do conservation. We need to conserve fossil fuels. We need to conserve water, whatever it is. You know, at some point in, in time, what typically happens is we can only do so much and we've actually you know, crossed over a threshold where uh, we've done some damage. What happens at that point, this is something that doesn't get talked about very often, is we have this period of what's called relief. And I would summarize this succinctly as every act of destruction is an act of creation. So we've destroyed fossil fuels, we've released carbon in the atmosphere, carbon in the atmosphere is food for plants. So maybe there's an option to be able to uh, fix some of that back in terrestrial plants, I've got a friend that's working to try to, to fix uh, atmospheric carbon in seaweed and bury it at the bottom of the ocean. There's all kinds of interesting ideas that are out there. More forests, of course, are very, very good. Uh, and then this period after release, we have this period of reorganization, which is trying to get back to some sort of new stasis. Uh, and that I, I would a rephrase as arising from the ashes. Now, this all sounds you know, very promising, like, well, even if we can't uh, figure out how to uh, tap the amount of greenhouse gases and prevent climate change, well, at least we can survive it. Well, that's kind of true. There's also this thing called X out here. <laughs> <laughs> what does that stand for? <laughs> so there's going to be side effects of no matter what we do. Even if we're able to survive, there's still going to be these, these negative effects that are going to happen globally. So we need to be cognizant of that. So going back to this idea of uh, reduction and adaption, adaptation, we need to do both. And I would still highly recommend that we focus on reduction. <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing in this response? Uh, we actually have a, a National Science Foundation grant that was uh, just given to me and, and two of my coworkers to look at this in, in Sunflower. So we're actually looking at organismal response to climate change, which is the title of the program, uh, taking 50 years of uh, hybrid sunflower data, trying to figure out what has happened over the last 50 years during active climate change to change how sunflowers are adapted to our North American landscape. And then using that as a way to develop predictive sunflower breeding technologies that we can use to enhance sunflower for more stability in the future. This is work that I'm doing with climatologists at University of Colorado Boulder. I think this is gonna be a fun study, but we're gonna have this uh, grant for the next four years. It's, it's gonna be great. Um, and this is the geography we're talking about studying, basically. 
Central United States, we've got data all the way way down to South Texas. Very cool. Um, so uh, that's in a nutshell what I'm doing. Um, uh, thankful for your time and and your patience, and oh, uh, I was excited to do this. I could I could I guess we had enough material for two hours, but yeah, uh, we could have done three even. Um, I, I do want to <laughs> I do want to let uh, anyone who has a question, um, you know, feel free to ask in the chat or to turn your mic on. Um, I have questions myself, but I, I've been talking a lot, so I'll let uh, let everyone else get a chance. Unless it's very well understood, Brent. I guess I guess you got your. Point. I think Cherno has a question. Charlie, yes, Cherno, yes. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ben, for the opportunity. Uh, it was very interactive and educative. Um, coming back to breeding, plant breeding in particular, um, like in the case in Africa, we realized that um, most of the seeds are old. So there are new hybrids that have been introduced in order to address, you know, food insecurity. Yes. But the challenges we have, like you said earlier, uh, establishing seed companies is very expensive. So, you know, farmers grow crops on a small scale and they always buy seeds because hybrids, you need to buy new seeds every year. So yes. in order to maintain your yield and this increased production. So this is an economic challenge for most of the farmers considering that they are poor. And secondly, you know, there is limited support from government. So what do you think will be the solution to this particular challenge as a breeder? This is uh, something that's been an active uh, thing I've been thinking about lately, and uh, I've been uh, conversing with folks at uh, uh, with the Gates Foundation as well as with USAID on this, and I've ha I've heard all of the different opinions on this. Everything from we should be avoiding hybrids for this reason so people can keep their own seed and and regenerate to something actually that I favor, which is the idea that. Uh, we empower uh, people in, in villages uh, throughout these areas to be able to produce their own seed and, and have the know-how to do it. I would make the argument that producing hybrid seed is, is really not that difficult. The difficult thing is getting the recipe and the parents to them. I think once you have them with the with the knowledge, the basic knowledge of, of how to cross two inbred lines, and you give them the seed that they have to cross, that, that it's possible to develop very locally centric, locally adapted varieties for uh, a number of these areas. And I have some friends that are in East Africa that I've collaborated with on this idea and they agree. It's really a bit of a, a combination of an education issue and a seed sourcing issue. And uh, my program is one of the few hybrid breeding programs where we, where we do still provide uh, the parent lines of our hybrids for free. Okay, thank you. Do we have any other questions? Oh, Ferdinand, yes. Yes, um, hello everyone. I hope you can hear me very clearly. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Brent, for this uh, informative uh, section. It was full of uh, uh, key uh, information, key uh, uh, inputs of, uh, in, in, the, in the area of breeding. Uh, please, can you hear me very clearly? Yep. Oh, okay, perfect. So um, I must say you, uh, you are doing a great research. Uh, you have great research experiences that you are turning your research into profit. That's fantastic. Um, I do have some uh, a couple of questions. Uh, I will start with the, um, your, your, your breeding goals. You know, I understood that you are breeding, you are making your, your breeding uh, um, uh, uh, of sunflowers mainly by um, targeting the seed oils, right? Um, yes. If you are targeting the seed oil, um, 
I, um, my concern is like when you are breathing and targeting only one threat or only one or two threats uh, uh, along, I mean, as time goes on, your genotypes will become maybe um, less resistant because so there are some genes that, are, that exist that are related to resistance, you know, and that also in interact with those genes of seeds, seeds, oil, and, 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 and uh, different other genes that may be lost, you know. And how do you deal with those uh, kind of uh, um, um, uh, situations? Have you ever uh, noticed those kind of situations? How do you deal with them? That's my first point. Uh, if you allow me, I can go to the second. Uh, otherwise, you can uh, provide answer to that first. Well, I can I can answer that one very quickly for you. Actually, we do, we do selection on uh, not just seed characteristics, but we also do uh, uh, selection on yield, uh, and we we do select on disease and, and insect resistance and general stress tolerance as well. So we're looking at the full picture when we're when we're doing our evaluations. Excuse me, when we're doing our evaluations. Oh, okay, okay, that's great. Um, Coming to the second question, um, uh, do you have any insight to share on fruit tree breeding or tree breeding? Because I saw you focus on uh, uh, mainly uh, non-fruit, non, non uh, I mean non-perennial plants. You know, um, I am in the um, in in at the um, uh, World Vegetable Center. We are dealing with uh, a broad variety of uh, vegetables. Uh, we are based. I mean, the headquarter is in uh, Taiwan. But uh, we are based in Bene uh, at the regional office. But uh, my background uh, is on fruit trees breeding. And uh, you know, the big challenge about fruit trees breeding is uh, all about uh, the, the time uh, that one generation takes in order to generate inbreds. That's the, the most challenging. Great challenge, and when we talk about that, the one optional thing is to think about the using geno genomic markers, uh, whole genome associations mapping, uh, in order to maybe use um, uh, genomic selection and all those stuff. You know, um, do you have some experience to share on it, or, or um, uh, you don't have any experience? Yeah, uh, we we do a lot of work on uh, developing genomic uh, selection. Genomic selection is going to be an important part of our. Uh, climate change work that we're doing on the NSF grant that I just mentioned. Um, and I, yeah, I wasn't able to talk about uh, perennials. There's just uh, so little time and so much to talk about. Um, but the uh, perennial flax work that I'm doing is actually uh, what I call a short generation cycle perennial. Uh, it is actually able to germinate and flower in the same year. So it's, it's very much in like fruit trees. Um, but even in that program, our plan is to develop uh, genomic resources for it. In fact, we already have. We have a, a genome that's already been assembled of this black species so that we can move forward with marker-based selection here within the next year or two. And the whole idea is to develop a genomic prediction framework for that uh, emerging perennial crop as well. So it's very important, especially for fruit trees, to, to have those resources. But also very difficult sometimes to get relevant information uh, on genotypes that will actually help your program and uh, allow you to make the, the right types of selections. So fruit tree breeding is very challenging. I, I, I give you a lot of uh, kudos for, for making a solid attempt at it. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I know, I know you. I, I mean, I understand that you have a hands-on experience on it. Yeah. So, um, if I, if time allows, allow me to pose uh, one more question. It's sure. all about. Uh, uh, can Can I proceed? Of course. Sure. Oh, okay, thank you. Well, um, you were just uh, presenting um, um, on your slide one variety, I mean, one genotype that you notice as a hybrid because of because it was exhibiting 1.3 meter of, of height, I, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Well, yep. um, yeah, um, I, I understand that you identify those hybrids uh, by uh, by crossing and outcrossing or generating hybrids, but um, do you have any other um, techniques that you use to generate? I mean, to 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 induce variations uh, in your within your genotypes, or it is only by crossing? Because I know there are a broad um, other ways of uh, of uh, inducing variation in, in, in within a, a population. 
We have so much variation within the gene pool, the primary gene pool of sunflower, that I really don't have to go to using techniques like mutation uh, in order to, to generate uh, new variation. It's sunflower of all the crops that I've ever seen uh, in terms of at least herbaceous annuals um, has crazy amounts of genetic variation. I've never seen so much genetic variation in an herbaceous annual before. Now, uh, I don't know that it would compare to uh, fruit trees in terms of uh, what's available in, in native habitat, given that a lot of those are uh, actively uh, cross-pollinators that oftentimes they're dioecious and so forth. Um, but we have a lot of standing variation in sunflower, so I don't have to re resort to anything other than uh, finding uh, existing inbred lines and crossing them. Okay, okay, Brian. Thank you for your insight and thank you for the presentation again. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. Um, well, we're just hitting the uh, hour here. So if anyone else has a quick question to ask, uh, we could probably get one more in. All right. Oh, perfect. Um, thank you then so much, Brent, for uh, doing this little presentation for us and for talking to uh, talking to us about your 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 breeding projects. I, it was really interesting. I think everyone enjoyed it. Yeah, I'm happy to be here. It was it was it was fun to do. Yep. Um, oh, and Ferdinand, you might have one more question. Do you mind a a answering that question? And we'll uh, we'll let you go, Brent. All right. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Um, it, it, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. It's not uh, uh, a question, but it's just a comment or an insight uh, I want to share with you. Um, I understood that you, you are part of EIS. I'm, I'm, myself, I'm part of EIS Bene, but uh, you must uh, understood that a lot of uh, our colleagues from EIS have not joined this call, you know, but I, I see this mainly because you didn't share it within the key EIS uh, groups. Uh, I just enough. saw yeah uh, uh I, I that's very uh, uh insightful um we can talk about that uh, on a message later on but thank you perfect okay well uh, thank you again brent um and i will see you uh in the summer <laughs> yes can't wait yeah it's gonna be fun <laughs> yeah and thank you everyone for coming um stay tuned in the chat uh, as mentioned and we'll uh hopefully be updating you guys on uh, more webinars to come. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.